Well, welcome everybody to today's session of Strategic Farming, Let's Talk Crops. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, today's topic is gonna to be focused around entomology and insect management. In particular, we'll be talking about corn, insect, pests, and, uh, and, and management. For today's topic, then we've got two people on uh, to help facilitate the discussion. Uh, Anthony Hansen, a uh, integrated pest management educator, crops educator uh, on the crops uh, educator team. And then uh, a longtime uh, IPM specialist, Bruce Potter, who's uh, done a lot of work with different insect pests over the years. And uh, welcome to both of you uh, to help uh, provide some uh, help with the discussion here today. So uh, with that, I do want to say that these uh, uh, sessions are brought to you uh, by University of Minnesota Extension, as well as uh, some generous support from uh, two of our commodity organizations, uh, the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota uh, Corn uh, Research and Promotion Council. So thanks again for their uh, support. Uh, I'm Ryan Miller. I'm going to be helping to kind of keep the session on track today, uh, doing some of the moderating. Uh, some folks entered questions as they registered for this meeting, so we'll try to get to those uh, questions. Uh, with that, I um, I want to turn it over to our guest today. So I think, uh, Anthony, we decided you're going to kind of lead things off. So Anthony Hansen will start it off for us. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I'm going to load things up here quick, and I think we should be good to go. Yep. So uh, today it's going to be all about corn insects. And some of this is uh, research that both Bruce and I have been involved in. Um, some of these other ones are pretty much all Bruce's research down in Lamberton too. So for those who aren't, um, you know, kind of up to speed on things, uh, Ken Osley was our corn entomologist. He retired uh, a little while ago. And in the meantime, we've had a search for a new corn entomologist at the uh, entomology department down on the Twin Cities campus. So we do have a new person in here. It's Dr. Fei Yang. Um, he was an associate research scientist down in Texas A&M as PhD in entomology. And he basically worked on um, pyramid of BT traits for corn, looking at corn earworm, fall armyworm. And he should be starting about May 2023. So we got a couple months until he's around and available for us. So um, you get to uh, deal with Bruce and I for a little bit here on corn entomology topics for the meantime here. But yeah, we'll, we'll have Dr. Yang on hopefully um, the field notes program that we have during the growing season. And also other times too. So keep an eye out for uh, more information coming out from him as he gets started up and uh, starts getting in contact with people there. So we're kind of excited to have someone uh, new in the mix here for another entomologist around. And uh, we definitely need it for all the uh, corn insects that are out there and the issues that we have. So start off uh, for our corn insects that we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to start with European corn borer and some of the Minnesota corn grower uh, funded research that's going on with that. Some surveys that are going on. I know uh, cover crops come up a little bit in some insect issues, whether it's corn, sometimes soybean. So we're going to touch on that a little bit. And then also at the very end, we're going to have corn rootworm issues. And a lot of that is Bruce's remaining research that he's kept going down in uh, southwestern Minnesota, especially. All right. So European corn borer for folks that are uh, definitely you know, a little bit older than me. They've actually dealt with it. I'm young enough where I did not have to. Uh, deal with corn borer or see it significantly um, till a little bit older working on these projects here. So it's something that hasn't been an issue too much for maybe the last oh, 20 some years, but it is a continuing concern. So we do have a survey that we uh, do every fall and it's been going on for you know, at least 20 plus years. And I think um, well into maybe even the mid uh, 1900s or uh, Yep, 1900s there, um, that the state used to do as well. So it's a continuation there. Basically, we're looking for randomly sampled fields, also not known non-BT fields that growers submit to us. And basically, we're going through the fields, taking about uh, at least 10 plants per field, doing stock dissections, seeing if we can feed, see any feeding damage from the larvae in there. Uh, so just kind of a little history lesson here. Uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture did these surveys uh, that we've continued I think it's actually back to at least 1963. So there's a lot of historical data going on here. And if you look at on this graph, this is just showing the number of overwintering corn borers. And you can see that you know, we have pretty high numbers getting close to nearly 400 at the peak. That's around oh, mid 90s. Then about 96 or so, that's when numbers dropped off. That's when BT sales began. And it's a great success story in terms of European corn borer and suppressing the populations. 
Um, we'd see pretty high numbers averaging around oh, um, 60 borers per 100 plants. And now at least up to about 2010 in this graph, that was only about two per 100 plants. So you have very good uh, reductions there. And continuing these surveys, uh, we have a couple maps here showing basically European corn borer larvae per 100 plants. Uh, if you're looking around mid 90s, you're going to have high numbers across the state, especially southern Minnesota and say 95. You're looking at close to 300 larvae per 100 plants there. So very high numbers. As the surveys continued in more recent years here, uh, we had pretty low numbers. Sometimes it was hard to find any bores across the state. We'd find just one or two per field sometimes. And you see that reflected in the maps on the lower part here where um, we have sites that generally weren't very high, but they're spread out just enough where we could find some pockets of the state where we'd find corn borer. And this is one of the more recent maps before I'll show some of the 2022 data. Um, 2021, we definitely had challenges finding corn borer. So good thing for growers, but we know they're out there in the background. Um, we can only do so much surveying at a given time, but we didn't always find at least a pocket there in central Minnesota. Um, this is not an indication of just, you know, it's only that one area. It changes each year sometimes where we do happen to find the corn borer uh, populations out there. And there are a few other maps out there too we use. So those were corn borer larvae. Um, we do look at just overall tunneling, tunneling inches of tunneling um, and known non DT fields. It's kind of our, one of our good metrics there where we can see high um, populations in these non BT fields, obviously where you don't have corn borer controlled. It's a bit of a refuge for these, um, you know, basically non-resistant insects. They're not at least so far resistant to BT traits. This has been documented in other parts of North America, Canada, but we haven't found any in the U.S. so far. So at least we can stick to that where if it's no non-BT, um, we know that we're dealing with these background populations. If you're in uh, BT fields instead, um, that's a case where we'd be concerned about resistance coming up if it does occur. So that's why we do this monitoring here. Um, the last graph on the right is showing another uh, 2020 population. So you can see how these uh, bullseyes kind of show up a little bit. And it's kind of a trend where southwestern, south central Minnesota, we're seeing some um, west central Minnesota a little bit or central. And then there's off, often a pocket over in east central Minnesota too. So here we go for uh, 2022. So this is a survey we had um, basically covering a large portion of the state, randomly sampling fields, about two per county usually. And this kind of shows just how much ground we covered. We had a couple of cooperators I see on the call here too, besides Bruce and myself, we had Angie Peltier up in Northwestern Minnesota. Travis Fulmer was doing a lot of the work in Southwestern Minnesota and Ryan was doing a lot of Southeastern Minnesota there too. So we covered good ground, um, but overall very low populations. So this uh, graph is showing, I know a few dots on here that show where we actually had positive finds. All the gray dots are just um, zero counts for larvae or tunneling in this case. And you can see that if you go up to um, kind of East Central Minnesota, there's really just one location that was heavily infested. Um, that was basically the point that was at uh, threshold levels, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And that's what really drove those kind of averages we show in the colors in this map. So really what's going on, there's um, we're just kind of getting an average of what we expect for um, European corn borer risk with these colors on here. So that's not an indication that you have to go and treat next year, but these do help indicate that you're close to an area where corn borer was found and it's definitely worth going out to scout the next year. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But I mentioned Southwestern Minnesota too. So again, these are randomly selected fields. We're seeing high numbers in some of these fields, but that does not necessarily mean that they are BT fields. Most will be, but there are some that uh, just part of random sampling that could be BT fields. So these are ones we're gonna try to follow up on a bit here and see what was actually out in those fields there. Now, those were all randomly selected sites. We do have sites that we you know, ask growers to submit that are known non-BT fields. And you know, we would love to get more, so we'll have emails listed in the chat, I believe, and also at the end of this presentation. So if you wanna get hold of uh, Bruce or I, we're hoping to continue the survey next year as well. So that's one where we're always looking for more non-BT sites. So we get to these background populations, you can see it's uh, you know, somewhat similar, You know, central Minnesota, south central Minnesota, we're still finding some sites of positive finds. Nothing particularly high in central Minnesota. So when we have these 
green dots, those are about um, one tunnel or larva per uh, 10 plants sampled, or bump that up to uh, 10 larvae per 100 plants. And that's just a point where we'd say, you know, it's generally at treatable levels, but definitely keep an eye out for populations in the area. But again, this is kind of interesting when we get to South Central Minnesota. Um, you know, there's that one field that pops up there that we had high numbers, and that's one too where, you know, we're not seeing these populations across the whole state on this map, um, but they definitely could be there in the background just because we didn't uh, have a high number of sample sites this year. So those two maps kind of give you an idea of what kind of the risk might be for next year. Part of this survey, this is the only non-insect um, slide I'm going to throw in here. Uh, Bruce Potter threw these slides and maps together here. This is basically another part of the survey. We were looking at uh, disease incidents too, and especially tar spot. So the map on the left is just um, submissions to University of Minnesota for tar spot um, uh, field analyses. And in that case, they have been found you know, across you know, good portions of the state. Over on the right is just from our survey. We uh, you know, found a lot of tar spot samples, especially Ryan, um, I think he got the bulk of them there. And yeah, we definitely could see them southeastern Minnesota. And then a kind of a gradient as you get to south central, could definitely find it not as severe. But we do expect that it is across other parts of the state, just you need to sample heavier to find it. So uh, we'll cover that a little bit, I think, in March for tar spots. So I won't go over that one too much more. But it's a good example of being able to get uh, multiple different kinds of data from these surveys that we do. I just want to throw this graph in here quick. Uh, I think Bruce and uh, Bill Hutchison put these together a while ago, but just showing the economic benefit of, um, so we have the BT crops, obviously, there's a benefit to growing that. But those that are growing non-BT corn get a benefit too by this uh, uh, corn borer suppression, essentially what's going on. So keep that in mind that, you know, if you're in a case where you could grow non-BT, it's cheaper, um, you may be able to come ahead there. Um, keep in mind, you may not be dealing with sometimes the highest yielding varieties, depending on what availability, availability you have from your seed provider. Um, so keep that in mind. But uh, that's something we definitely want folks to consider is if you can go with non-BT, that may help reduce the incidence of resistance to these traits popping up. Uh, one little bit here. Oh, sorry, I got audio on that one there. Um, we can also use the greeting. Okay, so we're going to just skip ahead here a little bit. So we have a uh, map of degree days. So what you can do in that previous slide, I had to skip there. Um, you can use degree days to basically predict roughly when corn borer is going to be emerging. So we have multiple generations. We call the univoltine one is basically the uh, second generation showing up. Um, there are two others that are split earlier and later in the season too. Um, so check out the VegEdge website if you want a little guidance on when corn borer is expected to be showing up. These are just models, predictions, trying to help you out to give an idea of when you should be scouting. So don't use that as the um, you know final end all of what to expect in your field specifically, but it's going to give a region wide look at what's going on there. Um, let's see here. So I think we do have. So does some. Yeah, sorry, folks. We had some audio uh, that ended up in the slides here. So. Uh, here we're going to try to jump back. Okay, I think we're good. Um, yep, so I mentioned economic thresholds earlier. And in this case, this is kind of a little bit older of a slide now, but it gives you a good example of how you can go through and calculate economic thresholds for European corn borer if it is an issue in your area. So I uh, just stick with yield, price per bushel. Obviously, this one's a little out of date looking at $3 per bushel on this one, we're closer around six now. Um, so you can kind of adjust that as needed for all of these calculators that are out there. And University of Minnesota does have one. I believe it will be, the link to it should be in the chat here at some point. Um, but you can see that some of these cases I converted this economic thresholds can be somewhere around, you know, 50 larvae per hundred plants. Um, so obviously if you go back to those maps where if I was finding 10 lar larvae or tunnels per hundred plants, we're well under thresholds in those cases. So that's why I stress, those maps are still very low populations. We can find fields that do have high numbers, but oftentimes it's pretty hard to find those. It's only just a handful in the state each year that we manage to find like that. Um, yep, so be sure to check that out if you do want to uh, do scouting yourself and find out if you have issues and if it's actually worth treating at a certain time of year. Um, 
Yep, I think we got these audio issues figured out. All right, so uh, just to summarize, we have multiple generations of corn borer. There's the first generation that's going to be early planted corn. Um, that's kind of the case where your insecticide may be the best option for control, and you might have the most yield uh, damage potential. As you get later in the season, though, we have the univoltine biotype that's closer around pollination. Um, it can overlap with the next generation, too. But as you kind of continue along to this univoltine and then second generation, that's where you have less and less yield impact, and it's also harder to manage too. So remember that this pest is inside the corn stalk. So if you're using insecticide, you have to be able to target either larvae or if you're scouting for egg masses, those are outside the plant. Once those larvae move into the stalk, uh, you basically don't have any efficacy with your insecticides in that case. All right, so that's corn borer. Just a quick summary of what's been going on there. Now, I know folks have been asking a bit about armyworms, so especially true armyworm, other issues. Um, this was an issue last year, especially if someone had a rye cover crop. So what happens is we have flights that come up from the south, and you can have uh, flights like we have the graph here. This is another uh, part of the survey project that we have supported by Minnesota Corn Growers. We have a black light uh, trapping network. In this case, this just graphs for true army worms. So you can see a few different locations where, especially I think Lamberton here shows up, you had flights coming in. So they come up from the south, they cannot overwinter here. But what happens is if you have grasses that they prefer, especially dense ones, or if you have a cover crop of say rye, they fly in, they lay their eggs, when the larvae hatch, they're feeding. If you terminate your rye, sometimes a bit too late, you have larger instars, basically more mature larvae, they can survive, that rye dies. Now they're looking for something else to eat. I've seen cases where um, you know, we had entire fields of soybean in Stearns County just dead essentially from feeding. And I honestly have not seen that for you know, quite a while. So it was uh, something for if you haven't seen true army worm damage, that's something where you can uh, definitely see a whole field basically losing uh, out in the crop there. But I believe we also have some from Claire Lacan here too. So you get in some other crops like our corn as well, that can definitely be an issue where you could uh, be seeing significant yield loss there too. So just keep that in mind. If you are using rye, you may be susceptible to armyworm infestations in whatever crop is being planted there. So keep out, keep an eye out, be scouting for that. And you may be in a situation where you need to treat. Um, but it also depends on keep an eye on these flights. And also if you're at a point where maybe those larvae are Know, earlier in the hatch, they may not be able to survive as well, but if it's later in stars, they have a higher ability to survive and move over to the other crops that we have there. So just remember that that one's uh, out there. Bruce, I think we'll talk about that one a little bit later when we get to the Q&A section. Um, but from there, we can jump over to corn rootworm. And I should mention, uh, these are all uh, Bruce's slides that he's put together. So we may kind of bug him for a couple questions on these as we walk through these a little bit. All right, so we got two kinds of uh, species of rootworm we have in the state here uh, that we focus on. And in this case, we got northern corn rootworm here. So this is one that we're kind of wondering about populations increasing in northwest Minnesota. So that's one where, um, you know, as the name might kind of imply, you have a northern corn rootworm. It's more of a regional thing to some degree, but we definitely do see some situations where we might see more issues with northerns in more northern parts of Minnesota. Um, and it, it's an issue in continuous and rotated corn. And this is one where we have what's called extended diapause. So this is the one where it's basically resistant to rotation. Uh, basically, the eggs can survive in the soil to some degree a bit more than the other species, western corn rootworm. And this is one where we would um, be concerned where if we have, say, just a corn soybean rotation, that's it. You may have uh, issues with northerns if they're present in the area. I should hop over to... Um, or mention that we do have resistance to Bt documented for this species as well, but also for western corn worm. And this is the one sometimes we have more issues or historically a longer track record of issues with our Bt traits. So this is the one where we uh, don't see that extended diapause, but it is a higher risk for our continuous corn. So if you have to grow corn on corn, oftentimes western corn worm is going to be the issue. Northerns could be too sometimes though. Um, so far, extended diapause not confirmed with this one yet, uh, but we got seems like more issues with resistance to insecticides and the BT traits. So this is the one that seems to give a few more headaches sometimes, depending on what you're working with. But um, yeah, if you cannot get out of a continuous corn cycle, this is where we're going to be uh, keeping an eye on a bit more. And Bruce kind of had a little bit of a history here 
of um, Western corn worm, especially in south, south, uh, southern Minnesota. But we've had a few different options we've had for control. So through the 50s, 2000s, we had a few different insecticide options, uh, but they've kind of been going over time since about the 70s. And then in the 80s, early 2000s, we saw that extended diapause for northern corn worm. And then about to 2009 and present, that's where we've been seeing that BT resistance. So again, BT traits in the mid 90s introduced, and then you know it took some time, but we were seeing that BT resistance breaking down. So going forward, um, kind of wondering what might be happening with our traits and what other options we might have. So uh, just a little bit of a reminder, um, obviously as the name implies corn rootworm that's uh, damaging the roots of the plant is larvae in this case. You can see a few pictures here of what they look like when you got uh, roots pulled up and you can see the larvae. And that can affect your crops, especially in years like we've had the last two years with drought conditions. So I know in uh, central Minnesota, especially uh, if you're outside of any irrigated areas, you could see just how quickly uh, some of that corn would be curling up. Now think about if you have injured roots from corn worm. Um, in that case, you're definitely going to be affecting yield through water uptake, nutrient intake, and potentially lodging there too. So that's one where we're definitely concerned about it when it comes to drought years, when it comes to uh, corn worm for the larvae. But when it comes to adults, we can see issues with them sometimes too. And people sometimes get concerned about adults uh, it all depends on the timing when you see high numbers. So we could have pollination issues if you have high numbers of adults uh, before pollination, and it can create a bit of an entrance for those sap beetles or ear molds. Those tend to be sometimes more of an issue on the corn tip or the ear there. Um, so it's something where if you're seeing a high number of adults, but it's past pollination, you're generally not going to be seeing um, something worth worrying about. But if you do have extremely high numbers, um, there may be instances where treatments may be worthwhile. But keep in mind, you're also dealing with tall corn at that point. You're looking at aerial applications. It gets a bit more complicated. And I think I'll let Bruce cover that one a little bit later. Um, we got some graphs here just showing Western and Northern corn worms from about the 2000s. This is really just showing that populations do ebb and flow a bit. Um, you're going to have cases where Northerns show up quite a bit in some years, uh, in some locations, and then populations might decrease. So it's just a little bit of a primer here for what we have coming up for more recent maps. So this is another survey that uh, Bruce has been leading up. It's basically a yellow card um, or a sticky yellow card uh, monitoring network that he has set up. It's both through individual growers and some data that's been uh, provided by industry as well, too. So this is just showing kind of all the different um, types of uh, sites that have been collected from over the years. We have mentioned uh, northwestern Minnesota as well, too, I'm kind of suspecting that we may have more issues up there. But that's something we need uh, more. Uh, cooperators for on that one to be able to pick up sites there. So let's jump into just kind of splitting that data out a little bit. Uh, when you look at long-term corn, so we when we do these surveys, you ask, you know, what's been in these fields for the previous, you know, so many years. So in this case, we have three or more years continuous corn. And you can see we have pretty high numbers in most of these fields. So you're generally going to be at higher risk for um, corn borer, or uh, sorry, corn worm in this case, uh, if you have continuous corn. So you can see a lot of these sites, in that case, southern Minnesota, central Minnesota, generally a trend there where those show up quite a bit more. Um, Northerns can be uh, you know, a little bit more dispersed there too. So we have, uh, going over to this, rotated corn. So here's a different aspect where we're looking at, okay, maybe you have just one year corn, one year soybean. That already seems to help a lot when you look at these here. Uh, there's a lot more uh, traps, we're really not catching any adults in many cases, and not as many of those red dots where you have more than uh, four adults being captured um, per day. Now, we do uh, kind of wonder about when we split them out again, westerns versus northerns. Um, you know, we have the extended diapause we know about, but is there potentially a variant for western corn worm having extended diapause? Uh, that's kind of the question there a little bit if something could develop with that if there's pressure for that, uh, but keep an eye out for that. Bruce had a good table here I like to show, uh, just kind of find or summarizing what happens with this continuous corn. So uh, you have beetles per trap per day, especially western corn worm. Um, you can have up to about uh, 10 beetles per trap per day in some of these fields when you have western corn worm on continuous corn on corn. Whereas if it's rotated corn in this uh, table, it's just at 0.7. Now when you hop over to northern corn worm, um, you know, if it's rotated corn, about similar numbers. Um, you still see an increase in northerns when you go to continuous corn, but definitely not as much 
when you look at uh, corn and corn situations. All right, so your risk factors for resistant corn rootworm to Bt traits. Um, this is the continuing issue that we're dealing with here, and it's going to be a headache more for management options that we have remaining that work and trying to make sure that maybe less um, reliable methods uh, can, can get us along a little bit here. So one, uh, high beetle populations, basically anytime you have a high number of insects, just more individuals population, higher chance of getting that one that may have the resistance trait out there and get selected for. Otherwise, long-term continuous corn, like I mentioned, um, but otherwise concentration of continuous corn fields. So if you have a large area instead, so if I'm just, you know, one farmer, um, I have one field that I just say I have to keep in continuous corn because I have livestock or some other needs, maybe ethanol production. Um, maybe that's not so bad if I'm the only one. But if you have the whole region or an area around town doing that, that just increases the risk even more. Um, otherwise, sometimes your planting date can affect things in terms of, um, or rather, uh, volunteer corn when that shows up. So if you have some volunteer corn kind of creating uh, or filling these gaps a little bit, um, that may determine uh, when you might have a little bit higher risk too. Um, otherwise, make sure to rotate whatever your management tactics are. So we'll talk a little bit about insecticides, but also the BT traits um, or crop rotation. If you can vary those, that helps reduce that chance of um, resistance popping up to any of those control methods. So we mentioned the traits. Uh, here are a couple ones here. You got uh, Viptera, Smart, Smart Stacks, and Smart Stacks Pro, and just showing uh, your basically root injury ratings. So um, higher ratings show just higher injury in this case. And you can see kind of as you increase um, kind of the number of these traits sometimes, so you have smart stacks in there, you see more control in that case. If you have an individual trait, um, you don't see as much control a lot of these cases. And Bruce has some uh, resistant populations in the Lamberton area. So this is from 2021. And you can see that, you know, this is kind of a good area to kind of see these differences pop up a little bit. So if you have smart stacks pro in this case, you've seen very good control still when you have these um, basically pyramided or uh, sometimes called stacked varieties. And you can look at some of these other sites too. It does vary a little bit sometimes. So Lamberton 2022, uh, maybe not as obvious of a uh, difference. You can see uh, we have the letters on the graphs here. So you have AB for uh, the Viptera one there. So it's really not a significant difference uh, statistically with say smart stacks in that case um, or smart stacks pro. So sometimes that variability throws a wrench into things for um, you know, both researchers, but then also saying, okay, what's the best option here? And you can see that over by uh, Wabasso too. Um, you really don't see differences as much in some of those cases, but um, yeah, you can see a little bit where Smart Stacks Pro would show up there for differences. So, and this next one, we have both traits and insecticides. So anytime you see a negative on here next to uh, some of the letters, that's just insecticide control without insecticide rather, I should say. And then also the positive is where you have insecticide applied. So in a few of these cases, you can see definitely the insecticides layered with the traits do help. Um, other cases though, you may not see as much of an effect sometimes. And that can partly just due to variability in the field um, or sometimes these traits that do work really well, you're not gonna see much added benefit from the insecticide there. All right. Um, yep, so we got a few of these highlighted here too as well, just with a couple additional letters in there for you. So you can see root lodging in this case here. Um, yeah, so sometimes there definitely can be a, a great um, benefit to insecticides if they're applied at the right time and sometimes the right weather conditions. I think we'll have a couple slide or a little bit of mention on that later here. But overall, this is going to be the uh, money slide here talking about yield differences. So you can see uh, quite a few of these again. Um, you're getting into say smart stacks and a few others. Um, you're really not seeing a whole lot of yield change when you're looking at layering that insecticide, but the insecticides are helping with some of these other ones that tend to be single traits there. All right, so we do get a few questions about RNAi coming up sometimes, and these are coming up to the market a bit now, um, but it's similar to BT if you think about for resistance management. In this case, it's going to be you know another individual trait and if you don't have any other traits supporting that, it's going to be another case where resistance can pop up pretty quickly, potentially. So that's one where you do need those other BT traits in the mix still to help out that RNAi, RNAi trait out there. So uh, our main worry is, you know, it's going to be tempting to 
uh, put this trade out there for the worst situations for corn or corn. Obviously, we need it, but we do need to be careful about that uh, situation where we potentially lose another tool there. Um, but yeah, overall, that's kind of what we're keeping an eye on. If you're going to be putting that out there in those worst situations, that's just asking for selection for resistance to all those trades. So we can't just manage our way out with the traits by using all of our other methods out there. This is kind of the last slide I want to throw up here. Um, Bruce had this uh, as a good summary a while ago, I believe. And I kind of like this because, you know, it shows the benefit of your treatment. So BT traits uh, and some of these uh, uh, research trials, you can see pretty reliable. Sometimes you'll get, um, you know, up to 75% control. Uh, but if you look at insecticides, granules or liquids, especially liquids, look at the range on those ones over the benefits. Liquids, you can have between zero and 98% benefit. So it's basically all over the place with variability. And that's in part because some of these insecticides um, can have variable efficacy depending on, let's say, weather conditions, uh, soil moisture, and also timing too sometimes. So just keep that in mind that, um, you know, if we rely too much on one of these individual management tactics, you may uh, you know, be running into issues with specific ones, or whether it's insecticides or the BT traits. So if you're wanting to use insecticides, be sure to look up some of these efficacy trials that Bruce and others have been putting out, and you might get some, some insights on you know, what ones have been working best for your, best for your area and see uh, you know, what options you may have there. So I think we can take any questions, it looks like here. Um, so, thanks, I Anthony. Oh. Wrap up a quick one thing here again, uh, Faye, Dr. Fei Yang. Um, I don't have his email yet, but he should be getting in contact with us for um, you know, getting info out to people here this summer. So we'll get that out for them there. Otherwise, uh, feel free to get a hold of myself or Bruce if you have questions, or especially if you know of any uh, non-BT sites you might want to submit to the European Corn Board Survey next year. So Ryan, I think I'll hand it off to you there. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Anthony. Say, so just want to encourage folks again to, to find that Q&A box down the bottom and put in any kind of questions that came up or came to mind including as we start our discussion here, if things pop up, uh, feel free to enter things in and, and we'll try to tackle those as they come in. So back when the we first uh, had registration for this session, uh, we took in some questions and they kind of fell into two groups, I would say. Um, we had a lot of questions around corn rootworm and we had a lot of questions around, or some questions around cover crops. So I think maybe what we'll do here is kind of jump back quick and, and hit the cover crop topics. Um, and there was one here, Bruce, uh, questions about cover crops and, and pest relationships. So maybe could you give us a, a high level overview of uh, what sorts of pests are we going to expect to, to potentially see when we're using cover crops in a, in a field crop situation? Sure. Well, I think the big, the big uh, problems usually happen with a rye cover crop that's growing in the fall. Um, Anthony mentioned the army worms are attracted to those cover crops. Uh, soybeans, they don't feed on, on uh, broadleaves very well, uh, and if they do, they usually die. They're grass feeders, but uh, if, you, if, you, if you have that rye cover crop out there growing in the spring and the denser and the taller, the better, that's attractive to the moths. They, they'll come in there, lay eggs, and uh, so armyworms are one of, the, one of the issues. The other uh, things we see and can see in rye cover crops are things like common stock borer. Um, we've seen some issues with those. Fall army worm, we had some issues uh, a couple of years ago, and that was actually uh, in the corn and rye cover crops, but it was also in, uh, in, the, in the rye itself, uh, taking out the seedling rye in the fall. Um, so I guess, the, I guess the thing with the cover crops is uh, basically you're adding a little bit more variability to a system um, and a little less predictability. Uh, you can manage all these things, but they do require some some scouting. Um, if you're if you're going to terminate rye and you've got corn in planted into that crop, or you're going to plant corn into that crop, um, a sweep net, some things like that, just to make sure you don't have some armyworm infestations just waiting to move over to the corn. Um, I guess that's probably the the best advice I can give you. So outside of scouting, are there any resources like online or uh, growth models or trap networks to, to follow to kind of keep in tune on any potential problems or? Well, we can pick up armyworm flights with the uh, black uh, light trap network. We also have some, have had some pheromone traps out. Um, they tend to tell you when armyworms are coming in. 
but they don't necessarily tell you where those problems are going to um, exist. I think sometimes those army worms migrate and then they arrive and then they re-migrate uh, to, uh, to other areas. Um, so I guess that's the one thing to watch is just alerts for things like cut black cutworm, army worm moving into the area in the spring and kind of relative levels. Um, those are those are the best places to look. So the, there was a question about army worms and how to prevent an outbreak. Are you just kind of, if you're planting a cover crop, you're probably at an elevated risk and, and that's just kind of where we're at. There's no prevention or, or what would you say for that? Well, you're at a you're at an elevated risk. They don't only attack corn; they'll attack small grains, um, pastures, that sort of thing. Uh, I guess the you can't really prevent the adults from migrating in. The only thing you can do is is scout uh, scout your cover crops, scout uh, tall grassy areas uh, on the edges of fields, particularly if you've had some wind and rain events and the grasses uh, have lodged. They tend to like those areas to lay eggs. So it's a matter of keeping an eye on on some of the high risk sites for egg laying and and going from there. They're spur, real sporadic. I mean, all these migratory pests they may be in one field and then two miles down the road you can't find them. So we had one question come in here live related to to army worms. Uh, are army worms only attracted to green living plants? Why aren't growing small grains affected by army worm infestations? Uh, yes, they're attracted to green growing grasses, the denser, the better, and or for at least for the army worms, um, but they are attracted to small grains. So they will lay eggs in small grains. And, and typically we see our, our infestations uh, late June to early July, uh, but they can occur a little bit later in the season as well if they have to go through a second generation here. Uh, and there was a question here from Brad uh, asking about the black cutworm monitoring project. Are you planning on doing that again this this year? Um, we're trying to trying to evaluate. I've got a technician that's moving to a, a different position this summer at the Research and Outreach Center, so we're trying to work that out before we commit. Okay, excellent. So uh, that kind of was where our two sort of uh, cover crop uh, related questions. One kind of tra to transition um, into the corn rootworm uh, area here is uh, something related to organic production systems and insect mitigation. Any comments uh, anyone wants to make with, with relation to that? Being what organic, you don't question? have... Well, what, what sort of uh, techniques might you mitigate uh, insects with in an organic production system? Were they asking about any specific insects or just no? In so just in general. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking of corn in general. Uh, you may be able to find, depending on the insect, there could be some resistance traits out there that are non-BT. Um, I haven't seen many of those advertised for a while, but um, that may be an option. I don't know, Bruce, if you want to chime in on any uh, organic insecticides that are used or a lot of it that we mentioned too is, you know, crop rotation is a thing, whether it's organic or conventional too. Well, there's applied formulations of BT uh, that the organic producers can use on things like corn, uh, European corn borer. Uh, so probably not going to have as many problems with uh, corn rootworms because they're rotating. Um, and even for extended diapause, those longer rotations are going to help them out, keep those populations down. Um, Corn, they might, uh, at least for the first generation in a, in a multi-volting uh, area, uh, they might miss that just because they tend to plant later than, than conventional growers. So those fields are going to be a less attractive. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there, they've got, there's some benefits that they're going to get uh, just by insects of, uh, uh, not being able to uh, persist in those rotations or uh, by timing of the planting date, they might miss some things. They might make other things worse too, but. Um, well, and so Phil Glagosa did some work with some of the organic, uh, I'll call them sprays for soybean aphid. Uh, those are all kind of, I believe, naturally occurring perithroid solutions that they, they were using for that. And do you want to make any comments with pyrethroids and, and soybean aphid? I know we're on corn, but. Well, there, you know, I wouldn't count on even the uh, the uh, uh, 
commercial uh, or conventional insecticide versions of pyrethroids controlling soybean aphids. We've got a lot of a pretty good proportion of that uh, population is, seems to be have some resistance to pyrethroids. Uh, the problem with the organic pyrethroids is that uh, they don't persist very long and sunlight tends to blow them apart. So uh, your efficacy isn't going to be and it's going to be as good. And I don't think uh, Phil had any luck with the neems or oils or anything like that either. Yeah, what I'll about chime in too. Um, this is maybe about 10 years ago now where uh, I was doing some research with soybean aphid insecticides and some of the organic options out there. And yeah, the um, naturally occurring uh, pyrethrums, which are uh, basically pyrethroids equivalent, um, they had a challenge actually getting some efficacy out of those ones there, I'll say. Um, yes, yeah, so I really didn't have much luck with those ones there, but that may have been the time too where, you know, we didn't quite have resistance yet to pyrethroids, but we would expect... Um, yeah, if there's resistance to pyrethroids, uh, some of those organic options too, if they're in that same group three in that case, we'd have issues there. So same thing in corn too, though. Uh, keep an eye on your uh, group numbers there for those modes of action and rotate through those too when you're choosing insecticide options. So Bruce, what about host plant resistance? Where are we at with soybean aphid? Are some of those being released or I kind of lost track of where that. Well, there's, that there's uh, some of the, some of the pyramids are, are look pretty good on, on soybean aphids. They're just not getting a strong foothold in the commercial market. Um, and I can understand maybe from uh, a marketing standpoint, if you've got insecticides uh, that control them um, and, and, you know, there's probably less impetus on getting the, Putting those traits or resistance traits out there, I think I think that's really the long term uh, way that we're going to handle this. Other than the populations of aphids tend to be seem to be going down anyhow. I think we've got more biocontrol going on out there. The weather hasn't been real cooperative for the aphids, those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I think I think. Uh, I think there's still some varieties out there that you can find that do have some aphid resistance, but they're just, they're not a lot of them. Uh, the breeding's gone towards uh, the silly herbicide resistance, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to things. find. Water hemp took, took control of the situation yeah. or, <laughs> but I, so along those lines, uh, if we were to put our insect forecaster hat on, uh, there's a question here about the dry fall and the impact on insects this spring. It may be even broader kind of kind of look at the conditions we're experiencing this winter. I know last week we had Pete Belay on uh, to talk a little bit about frost depth and, and the conditions we're having this winter. And I know we've got a lot of winter left, but right now, how is it looking for, uh, from an ins insect's point of view as far as uh, surviving the winter and be becoming problematic? I can chime in a little bit first and I'll hand it off to you, Bruce. Um... So I kind of like to say until it hits negative 30 or so, um, sometimes there's not a whole lot of interesting stuff happening uh, for, say, insect mortality. Um, but that's for things, you know, above ground, let's say like soybean aphid. Um, you know, that's overwintering the buckthorn. So uh, if you're, say, negative 20, you maybe see a little mortality just based if we had like a low humidity, but maybe not a whole lot happening there yet. But the main thing I'd say for this winter is because of all the snowpack we have, all those insects overwintering, you know, at soil level or in the soil, they're pretty well insulated right now. So that's one, uh, you know, even if we have a cold winter, remember we have a lot of snow there too. So that makes it harder to make predictions there and, um, compared to say a year where we have negative 30, negative 35 and no snow cover. Then it's a little easier to say that, yeah, you might have a little help from the winter there in that case. Bruce, I don't know what you want to cover on that one. Well, I think we've got good snow cover and I, you know, and it hasn't been horribly cold. So Western corn rootworms are, uh, the eggs uh, are a little bit more cold sensitive, but we've had a dry fall. So those eggs are probably laid a little bit deeper. They're a little more protected. Uh, grasshoppers had a nice, long, warm fall. So uh, we should have, should have had some pretty good egg laying success there. And for both of those now, it's just a matter of what that spring weather looks like. A cold, wet uh, June is going to be hard on those grasshopper nymphs. We'll kill a lot of them. Some of them will starve to death, actually, if they can't find food. Uh, the corn rootworms issues, both northerns and westerns, um, you know, if we have a, a real, uh, real saturated soils in 
in late June or in June rather when those eggs are hatching larvae are trying to get to corn roots so you can drown a lot of them but uh, it's not really good for your corn crop to have flooded soils in in June. So, so let's fast forward to spring then and, and maybe talk about uh, weather systems and wind direction and things. Sometimes we get uh, what do you call it like a uh, Colorado low and you get these westerlies. Is that worse for, for insect from, from a migratory insect standpoint now? Uh, or what should we be looking for with, uh, with regards to spring weather conditions and some of these issues with insects that migrate into the state? Well, for the migratory insects, what we what we norm where we normally see those come, the easy way to look for to, to dial in on those is is uh, thunderstorms that move out of the southern plains and into into Minnesota. Um, but yeah, there, there's you get these low pressure jets that'll that'll bring these the, these insects up, and and you know a lot of times they'll drop out on the back end of these thunderstorms. All right, so. Um, I think we can transition then over to the corn worm, and I encourage uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. But I've got a, a question here, um, just from a general sense. I know we breezed through a lot of information there, but we look at some of these figures, and maybe Anthony, we can uh, pull one of those up again. But we've got uh, node injury uh, scales, and Bruce, can you kind of explain to us what those numbers mean, and, and maybe give us some relative sense when we see. Sure. You know, a rating, what does it mean? Is it at greater risk of lodging? Where do we see yield potential loss? Um, right. So those node injury scales are based on the percentage of a, of a ring of nodal roots, uh, usually it's nodes five through seven, um, that we rate. We look at how, what percent of each node is, is uh, pruned within an inch and a half of the plant. And so if we've got three nodes total, um, the scale goes from zero to three and zero is no pruning. Uh, three is uh, all those nodes and all three nodes are pruned within an inch and a half of the plant. So that's as, that's as bad as it gets technically. They can put on some, some uh, another ring of uh, brace roots, that sort of thing, and they can chew those off. So technically it can actually be worse than three, but the scores we use are, are those zero to three. Um, Anytime you get over a quarter of a node, uh, you can maybe start to see the potential for some yield loss. Lodging usually happens a little bit uh, at a little more damage. Um, if you look at, if you've got a B tree trade in the field, a BT pyramid, and you've got a half a node gone or more, that's a, a unexpected injury. Those are the ones that need to be reported and then uh, to the seed company and, and uh, you know, there's follow-up and, and uh, some resistance management uh, practices that, that should take place in those fields. Um, so basically uh, anything below a quarter node, you're, you're probably okay. Anything, if you don't have to report anything, uh, it's less than a half a node da uh, uh, damage. But if you look at this slide here in 2021, uh, that smart stack on that hybrid on the right is is something that needed to be report is reportable. It's almost a node gone. Um, so did that, did that answer your question? Or? No, I think that's good. It just give us kind of a relative sense because you know you see these numbers and they're they're kind of abstract unless you you know like you've spent so much time looking at these roots and kind of get a good feel of what what this means and and so yeah, I think that that really is helpful. Yeah. We're always no. looking for volunteers to dig corn plants out of the fall in <laughs> August when corn is pollinating. And strangely, we have a few people volunteering. I don't understand. I, I have to apologize. I missed that, uh, that party last year. Um, so, so Bruce, uh, there is a question about interactions between uh, nutrient deficiencies. In particular, they were asking about nitrogen and phosphorus deficiencies and root feeding. Um, so clearly, I suppose, uh, if you're losing some of these roots, are, are these sorts of nutrient deficiencies more common or do you have any comments around that? Well, it works both ways. Anything that encourages the development of a root, uh, good root system, uh, you know, makes it a little less susceptible to damage from a given number of root, rootworms, uh, larvae, for example. If you've got a big root system and you've got 10 larvae on it, that's one thing. If you've got a small root system, you've got 10 larvae on it. Um, 
you know, you're probably going to see more damage. On the other side, as you mentioned, if you do have a, a, a root injury, uh, that's why we tend to see those yield impacts worse when it's dry. Um, you have issues with nutrient uptake and, and water uptake. And I should mention too that, you know, both phosphorus and nitrogen are are uh, pretty important to that corn plant in, in that early season growth and, and development. So um, there's an interaction that way. And then also there was some worse, uh, work uh, uh, out of U of M soils. And uh, I think it was Dan Kaiser at Ken Ostley's group uh, did a while back looking at nitrogen and, and uh, the impact on BT expression. And there is some, some uh, slight differences there um, with how well those proteins are expressed based, based on uh, um, nitrogen fertility. Bruce, I had a question for you. Um, with the RNAi, how do you think that's going to change things, kind of trying to add it into the mix for management tactics, or is it our growers pretty much going to be treating it as kind of another BT trait in a way? Well, that's probably what the a lot of growers are going to do. That I think they're going to put them into some really high pressure situations, and I'm worried about two things. One is uh, right off the bat having performance issues, and the reason for that is. Um, the RNAi takes a while to to uh, affect the rootworm larvae. They have to they have it works on uh, an enzyme that those larvae produce and they need, but they're born with some of that in, uh, enzyme, so it takes a while for them to use that up before the RNAi is effective, and that's why you see those uh, uh, that RNAi uh, added to the top of a BT and or BT pyramid. And unfortunately, some of these fields, these real high pressure fields have quite a bit of resistance and we've got impacts on the BT pyramids already. Uh, so I think we're gonna, you know, there's potential to have, have some damage with those uh, smart stack pro fields. Uh, if you if you just go out there, put the pro in there in a high pressure situation, real high pressure situation where you've had problems with uh, uh, BT performance in the past, um, I think I think you're going to be disappointed. The other part of that is like everything else. If you're if you're uh, you've already got BT resistance, that RNAi is uh, basically the only thing that's impact uh, thing that's most impacting those rootworms, and you're just putting a lot of selection pressure on that new trait uh, right off the bat. So um, encourage people to really. You know, really, if it, Western corn rootworms are the big issue, and that's really the the big problem is long term continuous corn. And as far as we know, in Minnesota, just taking that field out of corn for a year uh, is going to fix your rootworm problems until it gets reinfested. And you know, I think that's that's the simplest management practice for these high pressure fields. And the question came in about that. Bruce, is, is the studies that you're conducting on fields, they are multiple years of corn, and those are just the highest risk fields, and the best place to do the study, is that the case? I like to break things. You're, okay. <laughs> Get My results. weren't very fond of me at all, but <laughs> that, that's kind of what I do. I break things. He breaks things. All right. Uh, so there was a question that came in here. I think it was related to the Western corn worm variant and, and that exists in certain parts of the country and why we haven't seen issues with, with the, that uh, pest, I guess, or biotype. Uh, one issue, I think, is which biotype or which uh, rootworms actually migrated, into, migrated east into that area, probably a little different genetics. Um, than the ones that, that uh, we have in Minnesota or the Western Corn Belt. Uh, the other thing that we've got going in Minnesota is that that's a, that, that was a way for those Western corn rootworms to get around rotated corn. And in Minnesota, we've got the Northerns kind of, uh, kind of fill that niche with extended diapause. Uh, uh, Anthony showed some maps where we had uh, some Western corn rootworms in rotated corn, and that could be a, a variant. Uh, I doubt it though. It could be extended diapause, but it looks like it doesn't persist if that's the case, at least not so far. And the other thing that we have to realize when we're looking at traps or doing beetle counts for rootworms, 
those beetles may be originating in the field or they could be uh, could be coming into the field and, and you're catching immigrants. So um, I guess, I don't know if I talked all around the, the answer, but uh, it's kind of kind of it in a nutshell. No, that was that was good. Um, so that I do want to say thanks again to our uh, sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean uh, Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. And uh, thanks to them. I do remind you that this is a weekly program. So we'll be on again next week. I'll actually be on with Brad Carlson and uh, Dan Kaiser. Uh, we're going to be discussing climate factors and, and nitrogen management, some of the, the things that uh, weather related conditions, how that influences uh, nitrogen management. They've started a new program this year uh, uh, looking at that. And then I'd encourage you to check that out. I'm sure they'll promote that again next week. But Next week's topic is that. Uh, you can go to our website to see a full list of topics. We run straight through March. And so we really encourage you to check those out and participate where you see value. So thanks again, everyone. And thanks to our uh, two speakers and helping that discussion facilitation today. So.